Namaste. So uh, tech conferences are like rock concerts now. Yeah. It's interesting. I used to be a musician. Unfortunately, my audience was never as big as when I was speaking. So I guess I was upgraded. So it's really great to be with you guys today. Uh, I live in Zurich in Switzerland. Uh, I've been to India many times. So I'm going to say a few things about India later. But keep in mind that I'm not an expert, obviously, even though I've been many times. I'll talk to you about the future today. I want to uh, get going in a very simple conversation about this. You know, I'm sure you noticed that uh, humanity and technology are kind of converging. I mean, basically, when we use these devices here, when we use this, that's your second brain. Uh, it's your external brain. And for some of our children, it's the only brain uh, they have. So imagine this machine has, a, has the same computing power than the machine that brought the Americans to the moon. Here and here. In 10 years, what do you think this machine will do? Well, you can say pretty much any imagination is fine. <laughs> it's going to be unlimited computing power. Quantum computing, 5G, 10G, 20G. It's going to be on here. So many things about this are really good and other things are not so good. I think we have to keep a very good an eye, an eye on what that means and where that's going to take us, because obviously there's things that we need to consider. I wrote a book about this, Technology vs. Humanity. Uh, we're going to do a book signing later. There's a couple of books for you guys. Not enough for everyone, but probably a good start. So I want to start by saying that I think our world is going to change more in the next 20 years than in the previous 300 years. I know that's a crazy thing to say, really. The last 300 years, industrial revolution, before that, the printing press, World War II, the internet, television, telephone. But now technology is going to go inside of us. Technology is changing us, our biology. I don't know if you noticed this last week, there was a first Chinese doctor who did an operation on, on babies, or operation, a procedure, to change their genes to be resistant to HIV. The doctor is in jail now, I heard, a couple of days ago. But I mean, technology is changing everything. I mean, machines that can think, I mean, think about this for a second, right? Machines that can think. How many companies are promising us machines that can think? And you know, the funny thing is, we don't even know how humans think. <laughs> We haven't really understood this quite yet. I mean, it's going to be an amazing 20 years. I think it's 90% positive. I'm very excited about this. And then there's 10% different, difficult things, you know, things that we may wonder about that we have to think about. Interfaces. The biggest shift we're seeing today that if the internet is working, <laughs> you can speak to a machine like you speak to a friend. And I mean, the example here of the voting is quite interesting. You know, if we don't have access, then none of this works. So it's just academic, right? But I mean, the future will fix that. And, and we're going to talk to machines as if they were a friend. You know, the, the cultural implication of this is huge. I'll show you a short example. OK, Google, what are my reminders? Your reminders for today are, ask Kelsey to prom. OK, Google. Call 24-7 Lock Labs. OK, Google. Call Kizzy's Plumbing. Call. Well, you've seen all of this. Huh? Uh, I wonder one day we're going to say, hey, Google, I need to get married. Make a proposal. Huh? And it will just you know, get the whole marriage arranged, and all I have to do is sign with my fingerprint, with my Aadhaar card, I just sign. Huh? Another thing is that Google launched a really interesting idea a couple of months, two months ago called Duplex. And Duplex is a machine, a bot, that can call anyone on your behalf. So this machine speaks in whatever language. I think it's mostly English right now. But you can give it a job, like make an appointment with a hairdresser. It can act like you. So I found a very interesting parody of this capability of the machine. I'll play a short one for you. Hello? Hi, can I talk to Diane, please? That's the Google Speaking. bot. Hi, Diane. I'm calling on behalf of John to schedule an appointment. For what? The appointment for you to come pick up your belongings from John's apartment. 
Excuse me? John would like you to remove your belongings from his apartment. What are you talking about? I'm very sorry, but John has decided to end your relationship. Is this a joke? Put John on the phone. I'm sorry. So that's, that's how you could use the Googlebot, right? So, for example, if you had a political problem, you just call a thousand Googlebots and to address the problem. So it's quite clearly, it's interesting, but I think technology is what I call hell then. You know, it could be heaven, it could be hell. Clearly. I mean, every technology is, can be used for good or bad things. And the, the thing about technology is that technology doesn't want anything. It doesn't have any desire, it just, it just does the job. And, and so this is an interesting point. What are we going to do in a world that will be full of technology every time you turn around? At the doctor, for media, for music, for films, for television, for, for banking, for insurance, for government. I was just in Dubai a couple of days ago, and the government wants to use artificial intelligence to scan every person, right? to make sure that things are secure. Well, then you can say, well, clearly, security and freedom are kind of connected. Huh? I mean, it's a huge issue. Who decides? And so I think ultimately this is going to what I call hell then, you know, on Twitter, if you're on Twitter, hell and heaven. And we have to decide which way we want to go with this and what exactly it means. So in this world, I'm quite excited about it, and I often say the future is better than we think. You know, in Europe, where I live, there's so many people who are worried about the future. And why is that? Well, climate change, politics, unemployment. But the most common answer I get, I think this would be of interest to you in India, people are saying, well, first the robots will come and take our job, especially IT jobs. And second, the robots will kill us because they're going to be evil. So that's the fear here. But I think that the future is better than that. There's only one thing we have to do. We have to keep that power somehow in relationship to what we want. We have to harness the power, not stop the power. It'd be very difficult to stop that anyway. So I'll give you some reasons for my optimism. I think in within the next 20 years, technology will enable us to tackle a lot of long-standing problems, like energy. We're going to move into a world of abundant energy. So John mentioned earlier, uh, Spotify, same thing. We're going to have unlimited solar energy, unlimited possibilities. I mean, India is one of the leaders here, so that's definitely a good market to get into. We're going to have a long lifespan, longevity. Many people are saying the kids of your kids, let's say, you know, average age here, 30 or so, uh, they will live to be 100 years old. I mean, we're all dramatically getting older. We're going to get into vertical farming. Here's a project in, I think this is called JV City. Right? It's a project for growing uh, vegetables and so in, an, in a high rise here in India. Could feed 100,000 people. So if this happens, mind-boggling changes that we're going to see. But here's the challenge. We're going to collaborate with technology all the time, and it could be that sometimes there's things that are not going to be so easy. We have to define a sustainable balance between humans and machines. You know what sustainable means in the sense of environment? I'm talking about our brain. It is not sustainable for us, for example, to be constantly connected to a high input of data. It makes us sick. Have you tried multitasking if you're not 15 years old? Yeah. I mean, most people cannot multitask just like they cannot go without sleep. Multitasking is very difficult for humans. And also the real challenge is, you know, technology is exponentially exploding, and we're not. We're still the same. We're going to get older, we live better, but we, you know, we're not going to compete with machines. So, Take the example of medical care, right? We're going to see this as the future. Everything that we are and what we stand for can be expressed in numbers. Our genes, our biomes, right? And that is where medical is going. But if it means this, you know, as a second step, I think this is good, but as the next step, 
this idea of us constantly connecting and giving our data, becoming sort of a, a cyborg, that's for me a pretty clear no. I don't think we're going to gain much here. Right? So who decides what the difference is? When your art, artar is called, right? Art, artar? Your card, you know your card, right? When that connects the medical data, how can you be sure what happens with it? It's a very, very big question, a discussion we have to have, because I think too much of a good thing can be a very bad thing. In, in that way, technology is kind of like any drug, whether it's alcohol or smoking or coffee. Too much of a good thing is a very bad thing. I mean, today, technology has become the religion. The mobile phone is the new god, so to speak. I mean, it's interesting that we see the power of technology with artificial intelligence telling us what to do, what street to take, what date to make, what stock to buy, who to vote for. At a certain point, we have to think about, okay, that's interesting, but what if technology becomes this huge brain that knows everything everywhere? What about our own brain? Do we still need our own brain in the future? That's an interesting question. Because, you know, we can obviously tap into the global brain, we can find out everything we want, and we can have this natural evolution towards being superhuman. Well, unfortunately, of course, at the end of this chain, we may have some issues with that. The best example today is Facebook. Facebook started off at being a useful tool for us. And in fact, in India, many people are selling their services to Facebook, of course. It's become the, the platform. But now Facebook has its own purpose. You know what the purpose of Facebook is? To take my data, put it into a giant engine, an algorithm, and sell it to somebody. That's the purpose of Facebook. And Facebook has been extremely successful. If you had invested in Facebook in the beginning, you would have made the most money of any stock you can buy. So it's a real, I mean, this future is uh, interesting. It's, it's basically determined by these game changes. I'll show you uh, exactly what's happening here. But in this future, we're at a takeoff point of exponential power. You know, there's so many things 10 years ago that we didn't think were working, like the paperless office, cloud computing, all the stuff that's completely normal, and now it's working. Science fiction is becoming science fact. Language translation, cloud computing, interfaces, and these are the eight game changers. So in a company like yours, that's your turf, those eight game changers. Right? I mean, it's, these are the most powerful drivers. McKinsey says a value shift of roughly $100 trillion. Right? So that basically means data everything, cloud everything, smart, connected, computing, quantum computing, 3D printing, blockchain, and virtual reality. I mean, if you put all of those together, uh, it's like warp drive. Huh? And, and none of that actually worked until now. And now it's all starting to happen. So very powerful stuff. Here's three things to remember for your immediate future. Data is the new oil, AI is the new electricity, and the Internet of Things is the new nervous system. I mean, that's what your company is betting on, obviously. Right? This is where everything is going. So this is really powerful stuff, but think about the consequences of this world. Right now, you're looking at the list of the 20 most powerful companies in the world. The, four, the top four companies here, they have more money than the GDP of France. These four companies could buy France. Uh, they're probably not going to think about that, but who knows? <laughs> but I mean, look at this. They're more powerful than gas and oil and banking ever was. And where are the Indians? Uh, of course, in those companies, there are many people from India. <laughs> probably most of them are from India. <laughs> but. Yes, thank you. But on the other hand, of course, there's no company listed as being Indian, right? So it, this is basically what's happening. We're seeing this becoming the driver. And of course, you know that India is moving up uh, roughly in a couple of years, two decades, to be number two 
worldwide, dominating the world's top 10 companies' economies. So I think this is what India is going to bet on, clearly. So that, that would be the easy way of looking at it. But I think I have a more complex way to offer. Because basically what we're doing here is we're building a new intelligence. We're connecting everything. Cars, traffic, environmental sensors, advertising, marketing, everything is becoming connected. That is called a meta-intelligence, right? An intelligence of intelligence. Extremely powerful and also extremely concerning. Security, safety, ethics, control. Those are issues that we're going to have to look at. When we build things like this, we already have ethical issues with the autonomous car. Uh, thinking about how it's going to decide. This is China, uh, a, a, a software called Sense Video. And in China, this software is monitoring everyone, roughly uh, 800 million Chinese people who are in the system. And the face recognition recognizes who you are. And if you cross the light when it's red, they sent you a ticket via email. Right? Uh, you call that progress? I'm not so sure that's progress. <laughs> it's certainly interesting for the government. But this would be, uh, in my view, a little bit too far on the scale of being too intelligent. And this is really what we're doing. Right? We're building something like our own nervous system in the sky. That's pretty amazing, but at the same time, we have to think about, you know, how does it, how about those things? Security, protection, privacy, digital rights. I mean, this, I could fill the entire page with those things. And who is investing in this? I mean, do you see many companies saying that our future is going to be the protection of citizens? It's all about enablement and progress. I think that's good, but we have to ask a question. We have to ask the question, how do we solve those things? Because now we have just like when we talked about energy, you know, the side effects of energy, the externalities, pollution. We're now at roughly 500 ppms in the atmosphere, which means the next 20 years, all of us are going to be quite busy dealing with the consequences. If we do the same thing with digital technology, what are the side effects? I can tell you, for example, the power users of social networks have the highest suicide rate in the world. In other words, the more you time you spend on social networks, the more likely you are to kill yourself, putting it blandly. That's what the research says. The more time you spend going into devices, you know, the loneliness, the addiction, all those things are externalities. They're also growing exponentially. So what it comes down to is, for us right here in this room, today this is the question. How we're going to do something if we do it, you know, what is the effect, how much money does it make? But in a very short time, this is the key question. Ten years. If you're an engineer, you got five or so happy years for dealing with how to do stuff. But then it's going to be about why you're doing it. And who? Who can you trust? I think you see, you always said earlier, you know, we're going from the engineering culture to the experience culture. And that's obviously not exclusive, you know, they, they go together, right? But this is the key question. This is what we have to ask the question, ultimately, why and who is doing it? And this is the question that I call, in my book, the question of digital ethics. Now, many of you may say, okay, ethics, you know, behavior, values, that's nice, nice to have if you can afford it. The German poet Bertolt Brecht once said, dinner first, than morals. Let's make some money first and worry about the rest later. But let me ask you a simple question. Is being human optional? Are we going to make money first and then worry about being human? That would be a very stupid position to take. Because what good would the money be if we're no longer human? I mean, bots don't buy things. So this is something for us to think about, which way we'll be heading, um, especially here for India. This is a key question. I mean, India is betting very heavily on these three things, data, AI, the Internet of Things. But I think we should make another bet. Right? We should make a bet about this, about putting the human back into the system, about finding a way to put the human inside. 
Sorry, something wrong with my clicker here. So I want to talk to you about humans and machines as well and figure out where that's going for us and what it does for us. So the bottom line of this is, you know, we're going into a world where it's two poles, right? where it's about what I call algorithms and androgorithms, the human things. And I think the human things we all know, it's very hard to describe what they are. That's what makes us. I mean, data is all about accuracy and efficiency, but humans really are not about being efficient. Right? Humans are about feelings, emotions, the things that make us human, ultimately the things that make a difference. And when we talk about artificial intelligence, there's a great definition from Demis Hassabis from DeepMind, who said that AI is computer systems that turn information and data into knowledge. Think about this for a second. If the computer can take data and information and make knowledge from it, isn't that kind of what we are? Knowledge? If a computer can actually think and find patterns, wouldn't it be kind of what we do? And, and what is the difference to that? And which way would it go? And how would it actually interact? I mean, that is a key question, I think, for our future when we talk about this. Are we going to become useless humans? I don't think so. I think the fact that computers will become smart parentheses does not mean we're going to be useless. But there's going to be some of our jobs, our routines that the computer can do. So if you're in bookkeeping or financial advice or driving a car or working in a grocery store, the machines will learn it. And this is one of the key questions. What do we actually do when that happens? When the machine can learn information, like this machine here, for example, IBM Watson can read 1.2 million books a minute. 1.2 million books. So I used to study philosophy. And if I imagine I would feed all the philosophy books into IBM Watson, of course, there aren't really 1.2 million philosophy books, right? But anyway, he would read them in like half a second. Is IBM Watson a philosopher when he's read all the books? I think we would all agree that that's, that would be a stretch. Right? I could ask IBM Watson what, what's on page 45 of John Paul Sartre, and he would know. But could he explain the world to me? That's the difference. I think we really have to keep in mind what makes us human, ultimately which way we're going as being human, and what exactly, let me switch my clicker here for a sec, what exactly that means for us going forward. So I think it's important for us to, to remember that data and information is not knowledge. It is a kind of knowledge. If a computer has information about data and facts, like you know, helping doctors to decide, it doesn't mean it's really understanding. It doesn't mean it's wisdom or it's purpose. And we have to keep this in mind when we work with software. At a certain point, we still need to do the things that we need to do. Because I think I believe this very strongly. I don't know if you're with me on this. But humans aren't machines. I think you would agree mostly in Europe and in India, we agree on this. But in Silicon Valley, people are saying, yeah, humans are machines. They're just very fancy machines. We don't know how they work, but ultimately it's the same thing. I think we have to be very careful on this. I'll give you a great example. Jeff Bezos, who we, I think, all admire for his prowess, he keeps saying this, you know, for years he talked about how data drives all of his decisions. I could always understand this, but last week he came up with a new statement. He says, all of my best decisions in business and life have been made with hard intuition and guts and not analysis. So I could say, Jeff, please make up your mind. Which, which is it? What should I study? What should I teach my kids? And I think you know the answer. The reality is we always do both. We always work with hard intuition, gut, you know, the, the heart set, not just the mindset. It's really about both. It's about finding a way to combine them. That's ultimately the most important thing. 
So anyway, I, I was talking about what Jeff Bezos was doing, and I think he realized at a certain point that this is really our realization, no? uh, that machines don't understand relationships. And it's also something that I've seen in the past. Next slide, please. I've, <laughs> I've noticed in the past that we tend to confuse this. Eh? I mean, when we think about humans, this is kind of what we are. Right? We have purpose, we have passion, we have curiosity. Do machines really understand this? You know, there's a great saying, I, th I forgot who originally said this, is that if you torture data long enough, it will confess to anything. Right? In other words, Data is interesting, but what we are, I'll give you an example, you know, when, um, when you're talking to your, to your kids when they're coming home from school, they can give you information about their day and their grades, that's called information. But when you talk to your son and your son looks like he's grinning wildly and you realize that your 12-year-old son has fallen in love for the first time, right, that's here, right? that's understanding, that's going deeper than data. Next slide, please. That's very good. You've seen all of this, right? These, these newspaper articles talk about your jobs. This is talking about India, automation to kill off 70% of IT jobs. Next one, please. And of course, you've heard this before. Now, what's the truth behind this? Next one, please. I know I have too many animations to talk about the next slide now, but Bottom line really is this, you know, we have to get used to this. Anything that can be digitized will be. Right? Any routine machines will learn. Any routine in the next 10 years. So it started with manufacturing, then it's going to be about accounting and bookkeeping and all of those things. Right? But I think really what's happening here is that this is not the end of work. It's the start of a new kind of work. If your job is 100% routine, this will be difficult. But McKinsey's study uh, just a couple of months ago showed that only 5% of all jobs can be completely automated. Even drivers, right? even bookkeepers, right? people who do kind of jobs at every drudgery work. Right? Next slide, please. So really what we have to do here is we have to think about this as our future, right? moving into what I call human-only work. And this, you know, for my own work, this became really important. Uh, years ago, we used to write research reports, you know, the future of Switzerland, the future of whatever, and, and customers bought it for 10,000 euros. And now, if you want to know about the future of Switzerland or whatever, you go to Twitter, you ask questions, you go to Google Trends, and very soon you go to IBM Watson. Uh, in fact, IBM Watson is, uh, IBM Watson is a futurist. Right? You can ask about the future. Next slide, please. So going to human-only work, that's really important. I think it has great impact on our education systems, especially in India. I think India graduates, uh, last number I know, 1.2 million engineers a year, roughly. That's quite a few. And this is on this side, next slide, please. Uh, we're looking at traditional education being very heavily focused on this. Next one, please. I think we're going to see a change here going back to education that is human only. In my book, I call this hecky. Humanity, ethics, creativity. You're a little bit too fast on the slides there, thank you. <laughs> oh, we're going to get this worked out in an old-fashioned interface here. That's very important. I think we need to spend the same money in teaching our kids about being human than we teach them about being in tech. And imagine this, in 10 years, I think what people will want mostly from us is human intelligence. I mean, I talk to a lot of HR people, human resources, and this is what they tell me. They want people with emotional intelligence, with EQ. I mean, this is an interesting cause of you know, how uh, technology is changing education. Next one, please. And the next one, please. So, Here's our basic challenge. You know, we talked about this for quite a bit of some time now. Yeah, please, next one, please. Okay. When we talk about technology, we always get to the question of who is in charge of things. Right? I mean, the best example is what Facebook is doing to democracy. Right? We thought social media was going to be liberating our opinions. And now it turns out it's actually worked too well and now it's manipulating our opinion. 
Now we have to think about ethics, and here's a great definition of ethics. It's the difference between what you have a right to do and what is the right thing to do. And who of you knows what is the right thing to do? This is a somewhat difficult question. Even for me, I would say, okay, you know, I'm going to think about this. In which context would I make the same decision again? And who decides? Next slide, please. And how exactly does it work? So Gardner, the research company, said that digital ethics is the number one topic for 2019. Here are some examples. Next one, please. It's basically talking about this thing becoming all of a sudden a real concern for people. How do we interact with technology? What does it do? Next one, please. And how exactly does it work? You see a company like Tele Telefonica, the one of the most powerful phone companies in the world, they deal, they have a department of 20 people that do nothing but think about how technology is changing society. You have this organization here called the Partnership on AI, where tech companies are trying to figure out what the future brings. Next one, please. And now, of course, this is what's happening, right? Quantum computing. You heard about Microsoft and IBM and many others are doing this. Basically, when, when quantum computing becomes real, you can only imagine the kind of super push we're going to see here. I mean, these machines can handle a million times the data right? at, at amazing speed. Next slide, please. So we're going to see lots and lots of things. For example, the convergence of biology and technology. So far, if you want to have your DNA done, it's about $1,000 to do a DNA screening, and it takes four weeks. Using a quantum computer, it would take 10 seconds and cost $5. Imagine the kind of world that we're going to see. Next one, please. So here's our challenge. Technology is not good or bad itself. It's what we do with it. And since you're in the tech business, you're at the control of this. What is good, what's bad? Great example. I'm trying to get this right, Adar. Yeah. That is a great example of saying, yeah, it could be good or it could be terrible, right? I th personally, I think it seems to be mostly good, but I've heard the debate about it. And what exactly does that mean? Who is in control of this? Next one, please. And how do we actually figure this out? I mean, we have huge numbers already in increase. Next one, please. We have what's called the India stack, right? vastly successful. That's a great example. How do we make sure these technologies do the right thing? Huh? And who's in charge? So Tim Cook, the CEO of Apple, said something very interesting four weeks ago. He said, technology can do great things, but it does not want to do great things. It doesn't want anything. So that's, I think, for us a good lec a lecture because we can say, okay, our technology can do amazing things, but we have to, we have to give it the mission. Right? We have to make it do great things. That's a very important question for our future. Next one, please. So I want to talk about some societal changes. Keep rolling, thank you. Okay. Bottom line is this. Yeah? Technology would not solve societal or political problems. In fact, it will make them worse. Not so fast. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, you're getting there. I have to buy you a beer later, but the potential number of jobs being displaced. I mean, look at India, right? India is right the number two in that row. I mean, we're talking about a huge societal shift. Next one, please. How inequality, for example, has increased since technology has taken off. It's, n it's no accident that by the beginning of the internet, you know, 20 years later, 30 years later, we have more inequality. I don't know if that's a good idea. It's probably not something we can easily fix. Next one, please. But then we see, for example, what's happening with disinformation and fake news. So if we want to fix technology and do the right thing, it's going to take a bit more than just building it. We have to create a framework. The next one, please. And, and this is, uh, you can start the animation or hit the next button, please. Uh, this shows you the landscape of artificial intelligence and what AI has already reached. I mean, it's a mind-boggling development. We can see AI can play Jeopardy, it can play chess, it can play poker. I mean, it's mind-boggling what has already been achieved. I think we should stop, however, at a certain level. 
Should we really make computers that can really be like humans? I think that could be both dangerous and also probably very unnecessary <laughs> because there's lots of work to be done down here. So I think that's something we should think about. I've been proposing a moratorium on artificial general intelligence. You know, computers that can be like us. I think that would be quite a mistake for us to move in that direction. Next one, please. So lots of examples shown that basically artificial intelligence, of course India is very hot on this now, uh, is the biggest money maker ever. It's also a big weapon now for the military. And if we look at this and we have to say that because of these promises of you know, some hundred trillion dollars, it will take a lot of understanding and wisdom and collaboration. And I think India could take a leading position here to talk not just about the power of artificial intelligence, but what is it supposed to do? And how is it going to keep us safe? Next one, please. Bottom line really is this, you know, if you're looking at this uh, animation here, that a lot of the things are good, but at the very end, it's not so good. And it may dehumanize us. It may f make us forget who we are. It may ultimately come to the point of where we give up because Technology is doing everything. Next one, please. So this is what I'm proposing. Okay. I'd like to propose a future test for every politician, every public official, everybody that's in charge of anything is to understand the future. To have a test like a driver's license. So can you drive the future? I don't know how many politicians would be left after that test. But, you know, I think this will be a good way forward to think about how we can solve that problem. Next one, please. Because here's the problem. Our technology has this natural progression. As Steve Jobs liked to say, the technology is magic, but then it becomes sort of manic, and at some point it becomes toxic. Right? So it's, very gr it's great if we can use uh, WhatsApp or so to make free phone calls, and then it's a little bit manic if we post on Instagram every 14 seconds. Right? But if we sit around dinner and everybody at the table has two devices you know, and not talking to each other, that's called toxic, poisoning. How do we make sure that this works? So when you think about technology, what you're building, the key question is to ask, is this still magic? Or is it already toxic? So much tech that's being built today is toxic. The, the other day I, I, I checked out, uh, I went to a toy store and I ran across this Barbie doll okay, called Hello Barbie. Okay, it's off the shelf now for some reason. But Hello Barbie connects to the cloud so that your child can talk to the doll like it was a person. Okay? And the child learns phrases and the doll learns the phrases. It's like, it's like Siri and the Barbie doll. Okay? Very popular in the US. So what does a child that's five, year old, five years old, what does a child learn from a doll like this? It learns a couple of basic things. First, other people are pretty stupid, because the doll is pretty stupid. And second, the doll always repeats only the sort of mantras that are programmed into it. It's like saying on Instagram, everybody's a rock star. It's like a, a complete variation of reality. So Martel removed the doll as no longer being sold because of all these conversations about being a toxic toy, you know, confusing people. Next one, please. So the, uh, there's a company called The Future of Life that's funded by Elon Musk. It's an organization that talks about AI. They have some pretty good rules and I want to propose to you for your development in the future. First, all systems must be developed to be compatible with human rights freedoms and dignity. Next one, please. Second, they have to share the benefits. We're going to distribute the slides later if we can actually make that work. So you can take photos if you want. It has to be an ecosystem that's being created. And the last one, next one, please, is responsibility. I think this may be news to you, but I think those that design and develop and build systems are in the end also moral stakeholders. This is a, a, a thing that we have to think about. You know, 10 years ago we said our job is to just build stuff that works. And today we're sitting here saying our stuff works pretty well and now we're going to build more stuff 
And then we have to think about what it does and how it does it. You know, when you listen to Mark Zuckerberg talk about what he wants Facebook to be, it's pretty clear that he, he's realizing that he's built a monster. Right? And basically what he wants to do, he wants to demonsterize Facebook. I mean, that's a, that's a pretty heavy job. Next one, please. So I think we have to think about this. The future for us is leadership in digital ethics, in the ethics of technology. And I've proposed this in Europe and also in Brussels many times. We need a digital ethics council. I know India has lots of councils on digital transformation and AI. Can we have a council on the future of us? What matters to us? I think that would be a good idea. Next one, please. So I'll give you some summary and some action items and um, then we can have some coffee. So next one, please. In a nutshell, this is my future. I'm proposing in the book, which I didn't get to talk about, but we have the books here later. And I think it's awesome humans, to use a good old American word, on top of amazing technology. I think a future without technology is neither likely nor desirable. And it's very un undesirable, I think, for us to go back in technology. I think what we have to do is put the human back inside and think about what we really want. The next one, please. So, I think India could take a, a global leadership role here to say, how do we use technology for the good of people, for the collective good? How do we put the human back in the middle? And invest some real money in this, not just in engineering, but also in the experience, right? Because when you think about the shift from, from uh, engineering to experience, part of experience is being human right? and to remain human. Next one, please. I talked about heaven and hell earlier. We have to make the right choices today. I think we're setting up our future to be heaven or hell right now. We still have five years, ten years, it's not at the end of that pipeline, we're not in Black Mirror yet or in Skynet. I think we should be proactive, but we should also use caution when it's important. Next one, please. In my book, I set this forth as the final sort of idea. We need to embrace technology, but not become it. We need to use technology to do what it's supposed to do, but remain human. Next one, please. So, that's uh, my bottom line, and thanks very much for listening. Thank you.